Welcome to the Simi Church of Christ YouTube channel. Today's message is from Daniel Jolliffe and is titled Turning the World Upside Down. In this message, Daniel uses Acts 17 verses 1 to 15 to describe the difficulties that Paul had while preaching the good news about Jesus Christ in the early church. Paul has faced some who, with some who didn't accept the message, some who did. Paul never let anything deter him from preaching the message. Today's lesson is that neither should we. Welcome, and thank you for joining me once again in our journey through Acts. Today we're going to be looking at the continuing missionary trip of Paul and Silas, and uh, Timothy is along with them. And uh, when things got a little rough in, uh, in Philippi, they moved on, and... Uh, we're picking up the story right there. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many, a great many, of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, and they formed a mob, they set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down, and they have come here also. And Jason was, has received them. And they are all acting against the degrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. A little brief glimpse into the mission work of Paul and Silas and Timothy. They've just traveled by foot about 100 miles or so to Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica was a very large city. It was a major trade center on the main road through to Greece and then on to Rome. And it was a major port city by, for transport by sea. So whether you were traveling by road or sea, Thessalonica was a big, big trade center. It was a, a pretty big city for its time. Now, when we look at Luke, it, it looks like Paul only spent a couple weeks there. But when you look at the letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, you can tell that he stayed there probably several months. And Luke highlights the intense weeks of debate and when things got a little rough in the uh, Jewish synagogue. It was a large enough city to have, uh, Thessalonica was a large enough city to have a synagogue, which means, again, there was a, it was a big trade center, and there were many Jews in the city, and they had formed a synagogue there. And Paul always started in the synagogue, if he could. He always found fellow Jews first, because they were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. They were familiar with with the prophecies of the Messiah. And so he would take them from the known to the unknown, which is just good mission work. 
And so he always started there, and then he worked out from there. Now, during this period of time, some historians say there were as many as, you know, 50-plus messiahs that showed up in and around the time of Jesus. Those who were studying the scriptures saw that this was an, uh, an appropriate time for a messiah to show up. And so there was a whole lot of speculation. There was a whole lot of discussion about the coming messiah. And you can imagine if you were the Jewish nation who were sort of under the foot of Rome, this pagan government, it would seem like a very good time for the Messiah to come and throw the Romans out as well. So they, there was a lot of discussion about the Messiah. And so when Paul steps into a synagogue and says, I'd like to talk about the Messiah, well, they're, they're already into it. It's, it's a matter of great speculation and debate. And so initially, he's welcome. Here's another scholar from Jerusalem. He studied under some great Jewish scholars. They're excited to talk about the Messiah. And so they do. Now, Paul has to jump one big hurdle. He has to explain why the Messiah has to suffer. It was not a popular message among the Jews. It's still not a popular message among Christians. This idea that, that we have a suffering Messiah, we have a vulnerable God, we have a, a God that doesn't use his power to overwhelm people, but actually approaches us humbly, which is amazing when you think about it. The God, the creator of the universe, would actually come to us, share his message, and give us the choice. And so as he goes through the Old Testament passage, he proves with the Old Testament that the Christ, the Messiah, it was prophesied that he would in fact suffer. Because Jesus had been killed on a cross, he had to prove that Jesus was in fact the suffering Messiah. Because the, many of the Jews of that time period were looking for the conquering Messiah. They were looking for the great general to come in and just use his power to throw the Romans out and let the Israel nation take over the world. And that was not a clear picture of what God had in mind. So the first thing Paul had to do was go through the Old Testament with these Jews, show them the Messiah had to suffer. Now once he got them there, then he tried to show that the historical Jesus was in fact that Messiah. He his, his life story, his, what everything that happened to him matches the Old Testament prophecies. You can see how Paul is arguing this. And very convincingly, obviously, in some cases. But when he starts doing that, when he starts saying, this Jesus is the Messiah, that's when the conflicts come, because you have to react to that. You know, you can, if you're just talking about speculation... Well, there's no big deal. Your thought, your opinion is as good as mine, but when, when Paul moves to... And Jesus of Nazareth was, is, in fact, the Messiah that is prophesied in the Old Testament. Well, now you have to react to that. That's not just a matter of opinion. You have to either believe it or not believe it. And that's when usually uh, some sort of opposition would rise up. People could get pretty angry about things like that. And so we read this passage, but the Jews were jealous when, when Paul and Barnabas started having a popular response, a, a very positive response from both Jews and Greeks, it made the Jewish leaders of the synagogue jealous. And so it says they just grabbed some men, some rabble from the crowd, formed a mob, and set the city into an uproar. And I've always been fascinated with that. These are people who claim to follow God. These are religious people that that because of a disagreement on theology, they're going to try and stir up a mob and get these guys either stoned or put in jail. And I've never, never understood if, if you have the truth and you're not afraid of the truth, why would you go to such underhanded means? Why, would, why, sit, why grab a bunch of rabble and just stir up a crowd? That seems like a, a, a funny response, except that they can't argue with Paul, so all they can do is then resort to violence. Their accusation to the courts is completely different than what they're actually upset about. These men, are these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. They're just troublemakers. 
Not we disagree with them about the Messiah. They're just troublemakers. And Jason, the synagogue ruler, had, had, had actually accepted them into their home. And they, they, they take the gospel out of context and say they're, they're going against Caesar because they're preaching about another king, Jesus. Does this sound familiar? These were the same accusations made against Jesus himself when he stood before Pilate. So it shouldn't surprise us that these tactics are used once again. So they've got to get out of town again. The rioters went after them. They, they, they went to Jason's house where they knew he was staying. He wasn't there. They, they sort of harassed Jason. He's got to put up a security and be responsible for any trouble that this causes. And, uh, and so they've got to get out of town. And so the Bible tells us as soon as it was night, they were smuggled out of the city and went on to the city of Berea. Now, I don't know about you, but I might be a little discouraged. I might, I might feel bad if I invested all that time and suddenly a riot breaks out and I've got to leave town. Now, this wasn't a planned exit. They just had to grab what they could and take off. And, you know, I think maybe if I, but if that happened to me, I would reach the next town. I want to take a few days off, maybe to rethink our strategy, perhaps have a vision casting meeting, I do, you know, do something maybe different. Were they discouraged? It says, as soon as they arrived in Berea, they went to the synagogue and started proclaiming the message of Jesus. They weren't discouraged at all. They weren't daunted at all. As soon as they got to the next town, they did exactly what they had done in the previous towns. They went to the synagogue and started sharing the message of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting. We get to Berea, and, and Luke actually compliments these people. He says, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. These, the Berean Jews were different than the Thessalonians in that when Paul gave his arguments, when he presented his case, they examined it. They took notes on it. They went back and looked at the scriptures to see See if it might match up, if it, if, it, if it was a cogent argument. They weren't afraid of the truth. They wanted to hear it and then see. They, didn't, they weren't going to just take Paul's word for it. They're going to check it out for themselves. And that seems like a, a people of noble character. They were, they were a little more responsive just because they maybe couldn't argue with Paul. They didn't want to you know, have him arrested or thrown out of town. They were willing to check it out for themselves. And... Since this time, and because of this scripture reference, when you talk about Bereans, uh, it's an implication that these are people of noble character. Different audiences, different responses. Luke clearly contrasts the reception he got in Thessalonica and the reception he got in Berea. He's wanting to show that, you know, as with any group of people, there's some good Jews and there's some not so good Jews. There are good religious leaders, and there are some bad religious leaders. And he's showing that, that you've got both in almost any given society in any given context. And I understand that. I think some of my greatest moments, my most fulfilling moments, have been working with people in the church. Some of my absolute worst moments, some of the greatest antagonists I have ever come up against, some of the greatest attacks to me and my ministry have also come from people within the church. There's always some good ones, and there's always some not so good ones. And, and Luke is just highlighting this, that, that when we are ministering for the gospel, we shouldn't be surprised when we get opposition, and we shouldn't get a little in, too inflated when there's people that like what we're having to say. We need to remember we work for God. And whether we get a positive response or a negative response, we keep sharing the message of Jesus Christ. The Bereans weren't afraid of the truth. They weren't afraid to discuss the scriptures and examine them for themselves. And that's something we should all have in mind. We, we as Christians, as we study the scriptures, we need to be open to discuss anything under the authority of scripture. 
that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about certain things. And I, I say that because I've been in ministry long enough to where certain subjects are brought up and, and people will, oh, we can't talk about that. We shouldn't talk about it. There's, there's, a, there's a problem with that. We, 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 should, we just shouldn't discuss it. And, and if you're a person of the truth, if you're a person of the Word of God, that you shouldn't be afraid of anything in the face of the truth. And that we should always be ready to discuss it and examine it according to the Scriptures and see for ourselves whether it's true or not. I bring this passage in from Ephesians because I think it's important. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, and it's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned the word of God was proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. You, you kind of read this and you think, my goodness, why couldn't they leave? He left town, but that wasn't good enough for these guys. They're, gonna, they're actually going to follow him to Berea to cause him even more trouble. You think maybe, you know, some people just won't leave it alone, but that's not really what's going on here. This isn't just some bad Jews or bad Jewish leaders. This is Satan. This is what he does. When you take the gospel into areas that it has never been preached before, you suddenly see opposition rise up from, from the unexpected areas of life. And, and, and this is what he does. And, and in fact... It lets you know, I have a preacher friend of mine that he says, I always get nervous about starting a new ministry until there's problems and challenges and attacks on it. Because that's when I know this is something Satan want, doesn't want to happen. And, and that's really what's going on here. This isn't about bad people doing bad things, although there's certainly some of that going on. But this is Satan opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that should never, ever surprise us. So what's our call to action in all of this? We read about Paul talking to the Thessalonians and talking to the Bereans. He gets a little different response. In either case, they, they come after him and try to get him run out of town. Does that make you want to give up? You know, if our Savior, and again, this is part of Paul's message, if our Savior, the Messiah, had to suffer in order to bring about the salvation of the world, what should we expect as his followers? I talk to a lot of people who say, I want to follow Jesus, but my, my first response is, really? Do you want to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel? Do you want to be put on trial and put in jail for the sake of the gospel? Do you want to be tortured? Because that's what Jesus did. And I'm not saying if you follow Jesus, those things will happen, but but if you really want to identify with who Jesus is, there will be a certain amount of suffering for the sake of the sins of others, because that's what he did. That's, that was the whole purpose of his ministry, to be a suffering servant so that salvation could come into the world. And if we join him and we, just, we commit to following him, we are committing to doing some of those same things for the sake of the gospel and for reaching others for the sake of Christ. One thing we really need to learn is when the message is rejected, don't get upset. When you share your heart out and you share your story and all that Jesus has, has done in your life and the transformation that's taken place, and people say, you know, I'm just not buying it. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged. Find somewhere else and find someone else to share your message with. Because that's our job, is to share the message. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin. It is, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to transform their attitudes towards you and towards anybody else. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to open their hearts and their spirits to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our job is to share the story. Whether it's rejected or accepted, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's what we're called to do. And when opposition does show up, I want you to try to get a, get a different attitude towards opposition, maybe persecution. You need to take it as a compliment. You need to recognize that that wouldn't happen unless Satan was upset by what you were doing. 
that wouldn't happen unless you were actually making a difference for the kingdom of God. And so when, when, when these attacks come and people demean you maybe, or they, they tell you you don't know how to share, or they tell you your message is messed up, whatever it is, you just smile, praise God, and keep sharing your message. That is what all of us, not just preachers and church leaders, all of us are called to do as we strive to follow and be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Thank you for sharing this time with me today.